Hi, everybody. This is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. The name of my podcast is Ocean Raised. Here is where I get to dive deep into storytelling with some of the original gangsters of cuisine to find out where they started and what drives them today. Today, I connect with a longtime friend, recovered chef, colleague in messaging for our oceans and water systems, and most of all, a well-respected educator on the subject of practical sustainability in our environment today. Barton Seaver is on a mission to restore our relationship with the ocean, the land, and with each other through dinner. He has translated his illustrious career as a chef to become one of the world's leading experts and educators in the area of sustainable seafood innovations. Barton is a firm believer that human health depends on the health of the ocean, and the best way to connect the two is at the dinner table. Barton began his career as an executive chef in Washington, D.C. He opened seven restaurants awarded for their cuisine as well as environmentally conscientious businesses. Highlights in his career include three rising Culinary Star Awards, twice earning Best New, New Restaurant Awards, and being honored in 2009 by Esquire Magazine as Chef of the Year. His restaurant, Hook, was named by Bon Appetit Magazine as one of the top 10 eco-friendly restaurants in America, serving nearly 100 unique species of seafood in its first year. We're gonna talk about that. Your, your diversity of the, of the ocean is amazing. Upon leaving the restaurant world, Barton became involved with a number of local and international in initiatives. In 2012, he was named by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to the United States Culinary Ambassador Corps. He uses this uh, designation to curate international conversations on sustainability and the role of food in resource management and public education. As, as the director of the Sustainable Seafood and Health Initiative at the Center for Health and the Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Barton spearheaded initiatives to inform consumers and institutions about how our choices for diet and menus can promote healthier people, resilient ecosystems, more secure food supplies, and thriving communities. He also served as a senior advisor in sustainable seafood in, uh, innovations at the University of New England and as the Sustainability Fellow for the New England uh, Aquarium. Uh, Barton Seaver is a prolific writer. He's the author of eight highly regarded books, For Cod and Country, Simple, Simple and Delicious, Sustainable Cooking, introduces the idea of seasonal eating to seafood, where there's smoke, highlights the art of cooking over fire, his book, Superfood Sea Greens, A Guide to Cooking with Power Pack Seaweed, explores the health benefits of, the, of this emerging player in the superfood realm, his second sustainable uh, seafood-centric cookbook is entitled Two If By Sea. He's the author of two books in his role as the fellow in the National Geographic Society, the National Geographic's Kids Cookbook and Foods for Health, a science-based guide to healthy everyday eating, and American Seafood, Heritage, Culture, and Cookery from Sea to Shining Sea. It's the essential guide to more than 500 species, as well as a riveting history to one of our country's most iconic industries, his most recent book, The Joy of Seafood, is a compilation of over 900 recipes. As uh, an internationally recognized speaker, Barton has delivered lectures, seminars, and demos into a multitude of audiences. Seaver hosted the national television program In Search of Food on the Ovation Network and Eat, the history of food on National Geographic TV. He has appeared in 60 Minutes, CNN, NPR, 2020. His 2010 mission Blue Voyage TED Talk entitled Seafood, a Sustainable Seafood, Let's Get Started, uh, garnered over a half million views. Seaver has contributed to the Coastal Living, the Coastal Table, Cooking Light, Every Day with Rachel Ray, Fine Cooking, Fortune, Martha Stewart's Whole Living, The New York Times, O, The Oprah Magazine, Savour, The Washington Post, among many others. He's also the founder of Coastal Culinary Academy, a multi-platform initiative that seeks to increase seafood consumption through seafood-specific culinary education for all levels of cooks, which includes the online program seafoodliteracy.com. Barton Seaver resides in coastal Maine, a stone's throw away from a working waterfront with his wife, two sons, and her flock of heritage chickens. Barton, thank you so much for, uh, for being here today. To, so we can dive a little bit deeper into you, who you are, and your, 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 where you began. So welcome. Awesome. Hey, Rick, I, uh, to start off with, thank you for the, for the, uh, taking time to read the bio and introduce me, uh, you know, first and foremost, it is upon the shoulders of giants 
whom I stand. Uh, you first and foremost amongst them. So, uh, you know, you said this is uh, your podcast is the OGs of of cuisine. I, I am not an OG. I am I am a next generation to you. So, uh, this is a huge honor and a pleasure. And uh, yeah, you're I'm so really excited to be here. You're so connected to the ocean, though. I mean, uh, I've listened to you speak in my career. I don't know. Uh, I'd have to say two to three dozen times. We've on panels together. We've had all these things. But what I want to know is, where did you grow up? What, what, was, what was your environment? How many brothers and sisters did you have? How, what was the, who was cooking? And was there a competition? All that kind of, I want to hear about you, the things that people can't find out on the internet. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for asking about that. Uh, and hey, uh, to your listeners, I really appreciate the opportunity to be speaking to you too. Thanks for joining. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, you read the bio. Uh, there's quite a lot in there. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> where'd you start but, uh, where, 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 where were you born this you know well but but all of that is based on this like extreme sort of commitment to mission uh which was uh born of a really fun awesome tumultuous challenging terrible childhood um, oh, okay i don't mean to say terrible is the last one because all of those great adjectives were were really more important mm -hmm. but uh, so i was born and raised in washington dc like in the heart of downtown in a wow. neighborhood called Mount, Mount Pleasant. You know, and DC is a, is a town that, you know, quite honestly, not a lot of white people are from. Right. It was a, it was a black city, a vast majority at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was this really transient community, but I grew up in a community of immigrants, uh, mostly Ethiopian, Eritrean, Guatemalan, Andoranian, uh, a lot of Salvadorians. Uh, in in this neighborhood, I was read <clears throat> a lot of group homes that housed embassy workers, etc. It was just those incredible sort of multifaceted experiences and cultures. But what was so fascinating is most of those immigrants they were fleeing civil unrest in their countries, uh, the civil war between Eritrea and, and Ethiopia, the, the Sandinista conflict in uh, El Salvador, and so th there was this just depth of experience in these communities. And, and you know, I, I believe so strongly in the beauty and the value and the spirit of, of immigrant communities. And yeah, but that was imprinted on me so young. You get exposed to some of the greatest, uh, like exotic food, um, you know, introductions through that type yeah. of uh, immersion. You're immersed, you're immersed in a, a real rich community of all different ethnicities. I, I I grew up in Flushing, Queens at a time where there was a very yeah. vast uh, mix of, of, you know, different ethnicities as well. So I, I, what I took from it was when I was a paper boy, I'd be collecting, you know, in, a, in an apartment building, I'd ring three or four bells at a time, easy peasy. The doors would swing open and then the wafting of, oat, <laughs> of, of curry coming out of one or a lamb cooking, all the things. So tell me more about that time in your life and, and where, what were you doing at the time? Well, I mean, I was a kid. I yeah. was I was poking around in alleyways and playing soccer in the streets and generally <laughs> causing not too much trouble and, you know, trying to make sense of, of our world. But all of these little immigrant, all these immigrant communities, they were all served by bodegas, you right. know, and uh, when you're seeing fleeing civil unrest, you take with you <laughs> the most beautiful things in life, your family and your traditions. Right. And in a new country where you were other for a time being, you know, it, it's those traditions that so identify. Mm -hmm. And so food was not just, you know, Oh, Hey, here's a dish. It was, Oh, Hey, here's me. Uh, you know, here's who I am. Here's my heritage, my tradition. Here is my identity. And, um, you know, walking through these bodegas, the heady spices and the, the scents of the, the Eritrean, you know, cuisines and, you know, eating carambola and goat meat and all of these other things that were just normal fare at the bodega down the street. Right, right. But, but exotic uh, to everyone else. Yeah, you know, these things have just hit, you know, certainly not mainstream, but like uh, I learned very early on that food was this, provided this incredible connection be to not only our physical world, mm -hmm. to the fact that we import from literally every corner of the globe onto our plates, but also it's this cultural connection. 
And that that stuck with me and that that provided the seed from which all of the activities you mentioned at the outset in my career have bloomed. So how did you okay, so you're in your home. Who cooked at home when you were growing up? I mean, how, how did you get your, introduced to these ethnicities? I mean, they can exist around you, but they're behind closed doors and everything. How did you other than the bodega? The bodega, I guess, would makes a lot of sense. I understand the uh, inspiration at a bodega and the smells and the different colors and uh, the exotics that because it's new to you, especially, but also for everyone else, it's exotic. And that was your introduction to it all. So how did you begin your culinary career? What what made you say that I want to start? Uh, I want to open up a restaurant. There's got to be a, <laughs> a bridge to that, you know? Yeah. You mean, when did I take the insanity pill? Yeah, correct. Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you, you mentioned that these cuisines were behind closed doors, but but they weren't. I mean, I was playing soccer in the streets with these kids, and dinner bells would ring all at the same time. And mm -hmm. you know, you just where you ended up for dinner, who knows? Uh, <laughs> Look, if they got a big know, family, you can just sneak in; they'll never notice an extra kid at the yeah. <laughs> and, and one of the things that I'm always so just enthralled with is the generosity of uh, immigrant communities mm -hmm. and that desire to share. I mean, they, they want to express themselves. They they, we, we all do. But um, so I, you know, I ate in a lot of friends' houses and, you know, I went to public school and it was just, you know, that, that was the world. That was its mix. Uh, but in my home, you know, family dinner was nothing. Mm -hmm. And it happened every night of the week. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. It wasn't fancy. My dad did most of the cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and he would come home and he'd pour himself a, a finger or two of scotch and you know, put on his apron and start cooking. And, you know, it was, it was frozen vegetables from the freezer. I mean, it sure. was, you know, cans of beans and, but it was, it was not scratch cooking, but it was ingredient focused cooking. Right. You know, it wasn't dump soups and uh, stuff. And there was components on our plate. You look at the plate for it dinner was and there it was, was protein, starch, vegetables. That's how, that's how we, we yeah. you know, you had to have that on your plate. Yeah, you know, there were four or five things and then a salad. And so that idea of tasting and, and mm -hmm. watching the preparation and the ritualization of prepar preparation, yeah. even though it was like, God, you know, we got to cook dinner again. Now that I'm, you know, <laughs> a father, it's like, do I really have to cook dinner? Ah, yes, these humans, do. they want dinner every <laughs> night. What's wrong with them? Yeah. So but there was always pleasure and in, in togetherness around it. My mom cooked the, like the long things and she would do big pots of grape leaves. She would do chilies and stews and, you know, the fruit cake, uh, things like that. Um, and it, my, my dad was also, they were experimental. You know, we had Matt or Jeffrey's books. We had silver moon cuisine. You know, we, there was, Asian dishes my dad cooked. We made tortillas from scratch. Like he, he was interested in the process. So when I graduated from high school and realized this college was not for me, uh, you know, my dad said, what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to live off you. Right. I mean, <laughs> duh. What else? What else? Is that the deal? <laughs> what else do 18 year olds do? He was like, well, they get jobs and house. So he suggested restaurants just wow. It was a, wow you know because i was fluent in food mm -hmm. and I, I found a great mentor chef guy named david scribner one of the very best cooks i've ever known mm -hmm. and uh you know he took me in my first day in the job uh my shins ankles and toes were the only thing sticking out of the grease trap as i was plunged into it to you know clog it off and uh <laughs> And I liked it so much. Guess what I did? I showed up for day two and uh, it just turned out to be a really good outlet for uh, my energies. And right. you know, I was, I was working as a bike messenger during the day. I was cooking in the restaurant until, you know, close. And then I would go to close down the bar and wake back up at six and get oh, on the man. bike. And like, we have to admit something, know. Barton, we have to admit something. We're both just crazed ADD. Our minds, there's so many conversations going on in our heads at one time that the environment of the kitchen, the chaos of the kitchen is somehow a comfort, you know, and then you're in a, and you're in a, a culture, whatever, whatever level that culture is, but you feel accepted 
you know, and it's a great place to when you're when you're whatever age, you know, to to experience that that uh, that, that feeling. What kind of what kind of cuisine? What were they serving at this restaurant? What do you remember the name of it? <laughs> uh, it was called Felix. Felix. And it was a really inter- it was in Adams Morgan neighborhood, which was oh, beautiful. Uh, you know, a very interesting neighborhood at the time. There was one truly incredible, you know, sort of groundbreaking restaurant there called Cashin's Eat Place, mm-hmm. chef named Ann Cashin. But otherwise, it was rock and roll clubs. It was Ethiopian restaurants. It was, you know, I, halal I love, shops. I love that strip, you know, the, the, yeah. the, I don't know, three or four blocks, whatever it is, you know, in the, in the heart of D.C., where you yeah. just go to the next door and you have a completely different experience. You could be having the margaritas over here and Ethiopian food eating with your hands. And it's, it's, it's yeah. crazy. And there was a, a classic French restaurant called La Fourchette across the street, mm-hmm. which served, yeah. you know, uh, you know, pate de campagna and daubs and things like that. So uh, it was just a fun neighborhood and it was a bar as well, but sure. uh, David was cooking really great food. And he had come up through Long Wharf on Nantucket, uh, that great restaurant. Um, yep. You know, we were doing just really great crab cakes with, uh, you know, sour cream and whole grain mustard was the sauce. Just simple, but like very new American without being complicated. Um, we did, you know, our, we did this tuna dish. It was seared yellowfin tuna, sesame seed crust, you know, served rare sliced and over a cone of sushi rice because back then i mean you know this is late 90s like everything had to be tall or yeah. in a cone yeah or you know in a square mold uh um, yeah, we have alfred you know, portality thanks. thanks yeah that. thanks alfred Thank you. Alf- alfred the king of making things you know <laughs> unnecessarily <laughs> complex yeah <laughs> like what, um, year, what year is this? Uh, more or less, you, you 97 96 97 97 so you're yeah. working but there's work- like the the sauce on the tuna was uh, creme fraiche mixed with wasabi and then just a drizzle of like a hoisin, re- hoisin soy reduction. It was like, it's just good food. Was there, go- was, was, there good. Uh, was there wakami on top? Goma wakami? You know, the seaweed? No, no, no. That's, that that's the only thing missing in my mind for that era is just that, 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 net, that uh, obligatory garnish of uh, the sesame laden uh, seaweed salads that were sold everywhere, you know. I'm sure no, no. Well, see, today. that that was New York. I don't know if you're aware of this, but you know, DC was like a provincial outpost at the time. So, All right. you were doing your fancy stuff up in New York at RM, man. I had to. I had to compete against Le Bernard Dan. I'm, <laughs> you know, that was the, that was but, the era. Uh, it was good. It was all healthy. Uh, you know, competition. It helped to raise the bar all around. Yeah. All around. So okay. And, so and lot and lots of coolies. Oh, that's what I remember most. Everything was a coolie. Coolies everywhere. Yeah, there's no more <laughs> sauces anymore. If, if it goes in a blender, it's, it's suddenly an instantaneous coolie. coolie or a stick blender. <laughs> making these gigantic batches of things, bathtub size. The Coke <laughs> Bosk. It was insane. So, okay, so you're, you're, you're all right. So you, you got your taste. You're working in, you, yeah. you got them, and you've, you've mentioned a mentor. So just run through the different, where'd you go? Where'd you, did you go around Adams Morgan uh, for a while? And then did you, because I know uh, you've traveled a lot in your life, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just made sense that travel and sort of, you know, gathering new experiences came, you know, was just sort of a natural step, uh, mm-hmm. progression. Uh, I got a job at a place at a restaurant called Ardeo, mm-hmm. uh, which was far more structured and very professional and rigorous, uh, owned by a guy named Ashok Bajaj, who's a now famous restaurateur, uh, Knightsbridge group. And he's, I'd say one of the top restaurateurs in America. He's, I mean, he's incredible. Gotcha. And, you know, he was just on it. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time I was really re- introduced to a professional kitchen, not just the ragtag, you know, misfits that happened to create great things. There was, but, there was structure. Yeah. And uh, I got fired. And uh, <laughs> you want to, you want to, so, is there a story behind that? Or you can tell it. You know, this is it. It's a storytelling, uh, bro. You know, I don't really remember the details enough to not incriminate myself, but okay. I'm, I'm going to say that I wasn't guilty of, I don't know. Forget it. Don't worry about it. Pass. Yeah, I deserve Move along. I deserve to be fired. Um, <laughs> and it was my dad that suggested mm-hmm. that at that time I, f- I formalize a path uh, and suggested CIA. And it, it just never occurred to me that I was actually on a path. You know, I mean, I'm 18 or, you know, sure. 20, like yeah. I'm just doing, that's, just that's, what, 
it's what we, you know, that's what youth do. They just do. That's right. Um, and I got to CIA and click, just click. And it all worked. And I just, I dove in with such intent and authentic effort. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I realized that in my time there, and then I, so I graduated and, you know, it just, I did really well in the school and then I graduated and I, I taught as a fellow position for two years mm -hmm. uh, in meat and fish butchery, you know, under the legend Corky Clark yep, and, yeah, yeah. and others, um, you know, and I, in thinking back on that time, it's like, why do people love college so much? You know, why, why is it always like, oh, the good old days college? It's like, well, because you're focused, because you know, deep down in your heart that you're in exactly the right place, doing exactly the right thing with the mm. right people for the yeah. right purpose. You just, and even if you don't know what's next, you know that being present is right. Huh. And you know, in the rest of life, when are you ever, aside from, you know, the yogis and, and advanced, <laughs> you know, meditators of us, <laughs> ever that present. And for four years, I was like, uniquely present in my job and my role yeah. in my life and what I was doing. And I just absorbed. And you're good I, at I, it. And I was good at it. And I felt pride in that. I wasn't sure. good in school. I was a great baseball pitcher, uh, <laughs> but I wasn't good in school. I didn't know what I was good at or that feeling of, of like momentum. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I gleaned that there. I earned that there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Great school. Uh, and I graduated there in 78. <laughs> but I mean, it always yeah. was a great school. You know, it just, uh, it just, you got to work with Corky Clark. Corky, he's a, an incredible man with a military career teaching seafood and, and, and butchering of seafood and working with seafood at the Culinary Institute of America. When I went to school, that course did not exist. It wasn't taught. It was all about meat. It was pork, it was chicken, it was lamb, it was beef. Boom. End of story. That's what you knew. You know, if you if you got to have a chef that was embedded in a different course, like international cuisine, I had a guy named Bruno Elmer. He taught us how to mm -hmm. cook, cook, cut a fish up. You know, taught us how to make roll mops out of, you know, herrings. Uh -huh. like that, you know, and, you, and, and, and the wonder of it all. And you're so right. You know, when you're enlisted in a, in a uh, school, a college, whatever it is, whatever your chosen profession may be, you have you got the confidence knowing because you, you're you know you've got a metric your grades or or your teachers or your, your connectors, you know. So it just blows my mind that subsequently I got to know you and I got to meet Corky as well. I walked in on a class one time. And he said, "Why don't you just talk to the students?" I stood up there for forty five minutes talking about sustainability, etc. He was big smile on his face and he kept in touch. Okay, so CIA. That, what year is this now? You were 97, you were cooking on the, in Adams Morgan, and now you're yeah. at the CIA. Let's see. I graduated CIA in 2001 because okay. I, remember, I remember standing in the Italian kitchen when the planes hit the towers. Um, yeah, and we all remember where we were. Graduated uh, you know, a month later. Um, but, and then immediately I like, graduated on Friday and started teaching on Monday. Um, <laughs> But that idea of like just the rootedness, uh, you know, that's what I loved about where I grew up is I was so rooted to that place. You know, mm -hmm. I have a DC flag tattooed on my leg and like a, I am a person of that place. And yeah. for those years at CIA, I was just, I was rooted and I was getting everything I needed from, uh, you know, and, you know, it, it's fascinating because I've sort of, the next phases evolved from you know, not getting what I needed, uh, you know, not feeling rooted to you know, finding all new paths. And so at, after CIA, I went to work you know, at a times three star uh, place called Finch Tavern up in Westchester. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chef Santoro was, was running it and then Dan Kish. And, uh, and then I, I, I took over, back in DC for David Scribner, my original mentor, he was doing right. this other restaurant and he needed to take some time off. And I stepped in for two months trial by fire. And, yeah. And, and 
like was not going to let him down. You know, I was serving his purpose, not my own. Sure. And it wasn't like my ego that I was, I was serving here. Uh, and so that was like, it, it enabled me to succeed. And that gave me the confidence to be like, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, and also that I might have something to say. And, uh, and then I moved to Spain, um, just traveled around there for, for a long time. I ended up in Africa by accident. Um, wait, 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 how do you do that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought I was, <laughs> I thought I was buying a train ticket. Um, down in, I was, I thought I was buying a train ticket because the, you know, down in Andalusia just, they leave out like five of seven syllables um, <laughs> yeah. and I just, I didn't, I didn't get it. And I bought the ticket and I kind of, he was like, hurry, hurry, hurry. And kind of, you know, heard it. And, and like, I'm on a boat, the, uh, you know, doors closed. The ferry takes off. And two hours later, we're in Ceuta on the African continent. It's nice. like, all right. So I spent the night there kind of wondering like, maybe I'll just go back to, you know, mainland Spain. They're like, or oh, no, I'm just going to walk across the border into Morocco, which I did ended up living there for about six months. And, uh, <laughs> awesome. we're you know, hitchhiking down the coast, uh, out into the desert with the, uh, Toreg tribe for a while down in the Mauritania, Western Sahara, and then ended up in a tiny little town called Aswira, uh, the arts capital in a fishing town and worked as a sardine and octopus fisherman there. And, you did. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, man. And, uh, just, you know, I mean, informally. And, um, now, can I ask you something about octopus? <laughs> yeah. So are you, are you, are you putting down lines with the, with the, you know, like they, they hunt, they go for squid? You know, uh, no, we we were actually fishing in like in jars. Uh, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the target species, but it was just sort of. And hey, you know, while we're out here, we've got twenty, you know, basically just jars, and we send them down. And the octopus is like, oh, that looks like a cool house. <laughs> and you just pull it up, and it's like, it's like the saddest thing I can imagine. It's like, yeah, I yeah. caught you with a, a house anyway. Um, <laughs> but that was informal and. Uh, ended up back in Spain, and then I got a call from Jose Andres, and wow. uh, Jose said, uh, "Come home, uh, you know, join me. Uh, <clears throat> you know, help run my my flagship, Haleo, at the time. You know, he was he was still Jose Andres at that point. Yeah, you know, and now he is <laughs> Jose. Jose, you know, he, he is he is the one. Nah, man he's the man. He's the man. You he's know, doing, I mean, he is. I'll be. He was him. just in that ascension." Mm -hmm. of, of, you know, becoming just the one name <laughs> chef, Jose. Yeah. Jose and Reyes. mini bar uh, was really taking off, you know, at the time. And, and just, it was, an, it was an incredible opportunity, but I realized that I didn't want to be, I wanted to tell my own story mm -hmm. that I did have a story to tell and a point of view that, that was not what I was being asked to do at Jose's place. And, you know, it was a great job. It just wasn't my job. How long and, were you uh, with Jose? Just over a year. Oh, that's, and then, that's nice. I mean, was he, was he always, did he always have a mission? Because I mean, today he's got a mission to feed the world, you know, and uh, he's got political, uh, you know, motivation and for good reasons, you know, he, yeah. Had an issue with uh, our, our previous president because of uh, he was saying bad things about uh, the immigrants, and he's an immigrant, you know, basically. So he uh, he decided not to open his restaurant that was flagged to open in the Trump's uh, oh, said, mm -hmm. oops, uh, hotel in, in D.C. <laughs> and now he's just like this amazing man. He's up for Nobel Peace Prize. So working for him for a year, did it have any influence on you as the uh, ultimate yeah. um, direction that you take you took your career? Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. That because that was, you know, having worked in the food producing community and and this whole immigrant experience that I'd had coming up to that, and and working in poverty conditions in in Africa, mm -hmm. um, you know, Jose always was on a mission to represent Spain. Yes. You know, the the foods that he came from. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that garnered him attention. And then, you know, he worked for Ferran Adria and, and then, you know, mini bar. And yep. he was the ambassador for molecular, molecular astronomy. astronomy. Yeah. 
but sort of there's just this whole new way of thinking about food and uh, you know, and then he got into the social aspects of it. And he was the board chair at the time at DC Central Kitchen, um, a visionary organization founded by a guy named Robert Egger, um, who was among my very best friends, officiated our wedding. Uh, and Robert's vision was not to feed the breadline, but to gather unused food from catering, from hotels, from restaurants that you know there's a huge it's, amount of food is thrown tons. away it's it's a, it's a sin yeah and robert's gig was like i'm not just gonna take this food and repurpose it to feed these people or just relocate it to feed these people i'm going to repurpose it mm -hmm. and use it to create a culinary job training program i'm not going to feed the bread line i'm going to end the bread line and that model has now been replicated with Fresh Start, uh, with community kitchens all over the country, with campus kitchens programs. You know, and, and Robert revolutionized food in that way. You know, like Alice Waters revolutionized food by asking us to pay attention to the ingredients we were using. Right. Robert revolutionized food by asking us to pay attention to the ingredients we weren't using. Mm -hmm. And the ingredients in our society that we simply weren't appreciating and that's the people we didn't the deem people society had failed you know we, we didn't deem it good enough to go on our dinner table you know and, and we, we could talk about that in a minute but i still want to go through your career before we start going yeah. into well uh, diversity yeah and, and 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 the people that he was training and feeding were people that society had deemed not worthy of our appreciation mm -hmm. and you know he brought them back into the fold um you know, these are people that needed a, a second, a fifth, a tenth chance in life who had never been surrounded by supportive networks or had been told, you know what, this is a country of opportunity for you, not just for others. That's right. And, <laughs> you know, you look at the successes of D.C. Central Kitchen, like the recidivism rate in D.C. is something like 85 mm percent. -hmm. The recidivism rate on graduates from or participants in the central kitchen program is three percent it's just like That's oh my gosh difference. you you took our track or you know the discards of society the discards of our kitchens and turned it into utter gold you know right. and uh that mentality and, and jose's participation and introduction for me to that Mm -hmm. was when I learned that chefs are more than the sum of ingredients we put on a plate. Right. We are the cog in the wheel that brings humanity to its best. And that's when I decided what I had to say and so, went off and went off and did it. Tell us what you do. Yeah. What did I do? Oh, you opened hook. Uh, I, what I mean, tell me about your, well, before that, before that, I went to, I, I opened a, or this little restaurant called Cafe St. X mm -hmm. over on 14th and T streets. Uh, yeah. This little bar restaurant on one corner. We had a, uh, some crack dealers on the opposite corner. We had a bulletproof glass liquor store on the caddy corner. And then, uh, neighborhood prostitutes used this corner. Wonderful. I, you know what? Every, I, I, not, I don't agree with how you're making your money, but we're all here for a purpose. Everybody looked out for each other. They used our bathrooms. You know, it's just like, so it was this kind of wonderful, amazing urban thing where we are the number one Chimay beer count in all of North America, but we also have, you know, so, an open so door you're serving high end. You're serving high end Belgian beer in a, in a, on that, on that quadrant, that corner there. That's yeah. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, we've got trans, we've got trans prostitutes walking through the restaurant to go to the bathroom. And they were like, Oh, Hey, trans, trans, uh, no, little local like, so this is your restaurant. You uh, I was, I was the chef there. Okay. Uh, I didn't own it, but it was just this really amazing integration. And it was housed in the building that was Duke Ellington's parents' corner store that they ran. Wow. Like this cool. is just a, an amazing place. And I committed myself to doing the very best burger in D.C. Mm. To, you know, it was never going to be the very best roast chicken, but to doing a damn good roast chicken. And food that was simple and straightforward, but thoughtful and intelligent. And that idea of committing thyself to the result, not to the ego, 
That's when I learned to take myself off the plate. I am not the most delicious thing in this restaurant. <laughs> it, it's the wood grill and the conscientiously sourced beef and the butter toasted bun and the shredded yeah. cold cheddar cheese that goes Making on top. Hungry. Not this melted, melted slimy bullshit. Like no, like cold <laughs> cheddar cheese. So you get this textural contrast running through and a little bit of shaved cabbage under that beef patty. So there's a crunch on the, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, you know that, that's the way to look at a, a dish that's a, you got to get into it you got to get in that right. you got to jump on the plate with it and become part of it right but don't take yourself seriously nah. take it seriously so it was that mentality and and then i uh, opened another restaurant called bar pilar and, and then got offered this opportunity to do hook um and it was a sustain you know a seafood restaurant was the concept and i said well i'll do it if we can make it a sustainable seafood restaurant mm. and the owner said uh What's that? Yeah, I said, exactly. I said, it's seafood. That, that's it. He said, okay, great. It's yours. Go for it. And so opened that as a chef partner owner and uh, just had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And uh, we just did what we wanted to. We changed the menu, middle of service. We bought whatever fish we could find. We had 13 I different fish purveyors. We, you know, you we were doing such volume that I could buy whole boats. People would be like, oh, hey, I, you know, I went out and emptied the pound net down at Chesapeake and I got, you know, this. Be like, send me the boat. Yeah. yeah. That's, was, that's, that's a nice position to be in. You know, I, I remember when, I, when I'd go to the Fulton Fish Market, I, I, was, I didn't have any buying power whatsoever. You know, I was just basically learning, touching, asking questions, being a pain in the neck in a very busy environment. And eventually I worked my way into where I was purchasing and so that is such an, a great place to be. And your choices, according to your bio said over 100 different species within a year you would serve. So you yeah. were introducing species and at that time, especially, and even now to a certain extent, you know, uh, that's risky, you know, that you end up feeding it to the family the next day because uh, the, your clientele, uh, has their four favorites picked out and that's what they're looking for on your menu, your mm -hmm. myriad of uh, introductions. How did you get people to uh, try a uh, species that they never um, had been introduced to before? Well, it, it's all about narrative. It's about storytelling. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the, the only, the, the most foundational ingredient in any recipe is trust. And, oh, uh, that's what we built. And we started this from, from the get go. If you look at our opening day menu, you know, it, it, it was, it was just, you know, it was just fish from all over the place. And my number one seller in my signature dish was bluefish. Oh. And prior to opening, I called up uh, my dear friend, Lauren D'Angelo at Samuels and Sons. She's mm -hmm. uh, the daughter of, of the founder and just an incredible woman. And I, I love her dearly. Yeah. Um, and I said, I, you know, I want to put bluefish on my menu. She's like, we don't carry bluefish. Uh, I was like, well, get me some bluefish. She's well, you're going to have to buy a minimum. You know, I'm, I'm not going to bring it in just, right. you know, and let it go bad on my end. It's like, fine. Uh, you know, I'll take 50 pounds a day of filet. Right. And she's like, okay. I ended up taking about 100, 120 pounds a day of filet. Wow. Um, and by the way, it was a buck 25 for filet. That's no. the same, but what, what everybody needs to know is that if those that are, are listening that aren't from the Northeast and understand the bluefish, you know, these, these are voracious, uh, high speed, crazed animals. When they, when you're fishing for them, you don't fish, you just get a strike, you don't get a nibble, you don't get a bite, you just <clears throat> flies. And this fish, as soon as you pull it out of the water, how it's handled and how quickly you can you process it becomes extremely, do you, do you agree with this? Extremely critical because this is a fish that has a timer on it. So you have to have very depth hands to know what to do. Obviously you had a lot of experience, you know, with the knife because you taught at CIA how to do so. So, you know, you, did you pull the, the bloodline out of the middle, the dark spot, or did you, did you somehow integrate no. that? You did not. No, uh, we served it skin on, That's you know, we, we weren't go. we, we were specifying smaller fish. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it is a species where you, uh, snapper blues it, it's sustainable from a small size all the way up mm -hmm. and they get more heavily flavored as, as they grow larger um but uh, no i mean we just we served it unapologetically and you're right i mean bluefish when it's pulled from the water is the most glorious thing from the sea 
which very quickly turns into the worst out of the sea. Uh, and, but you've got a window there and there's no such thing as bad bluefish. There's only once glorious bluefish poorly treated. Uh, there you go. Oh, we used to fish that one with my dad. You know? Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's classic, immediately put it on the New grill. York. It was immediately on the grill with garlic, and they seasoned it heavy, and put garlic and tomato in oh, there, yeah. and wrapped it in foil, and put it on the grill. <sighs> Man, yeah. just, you, you pull out a piece of the flesh, and you just see the little squigglies in it, and it's absolutely yeah. But scary. when Uncle Carl pulls it out of the back of the Kenmore, where it's been languishing in the freezer since last summer, no, when he no, caught it on a party no, boat, no, where yeah. he pulled up ten fish and let them sit on the deck until it was four p.m. and he was drunk, and he got it in the freezer at eight you know you're like <laughs> you better of be, course it's terrible <laughs> yeah you better be smoking that and making a, a dip out of it lots of capers and stuff but otherwise you're not going to eat that so oh uh, okay so we, we so we we started off from the beginning of like yeah. our identity was exploration of the seas mm -hmm. and this was at a point you're you're right where you know seafood was you have four options you know on, on a menu and you know tuna had just been introduced as a you know an entree right um but I had a whole menu, you know, I had, I had uh, 10 apps, uh, you know, six of more seafood. I had anywhere from 12 to 15 entrees. One of them was meat, one vegetarian. It just gave me a lot of, you know, I didn't have to compete with scallops and halibut and shrimp and salmon because I have this whole menu of, of incredible options. And it was great to be able to call up fishermen and say, wait, wait, what, what did you catch? Uh, do I want it? Sure. But hold on. Let me get my Audubon guide out and figure yeah. out what is this thing? What is Totog? You know, <laughs> like, what is bearded Brotula? I mean, that like, <laughs> you know, that sounds like Dracula's like long lost <laughs> elementary school friend. <laughs> you know, like, like, but, oh, it's a hake. Oh, it's a beautiful flaky white flesh fish with a thin skin, no bloodline, slight stitching to it, incredible oh. gentle flake and aroma of like sweet baked potato with butter off of it, slightly nutty. And yeah, I'll sear that up and serve it with white beans stewed with fennel seeds and a little herb salad, thin shaped fennel on top, scented yeah. with mint. Like, oh yeah. 100%. And so when my servers went out to the table, they were like, oh man, we just got this fish in. It's got the silliest name. It's bearded Brotula. Ew, can you believe that? But it's delicious. There was this engagement. Yeah. And there was also purpose behind it, which sure. is we're sustaining these these fisheries and the fishermen. So that became what we were known for. Mm -hmm. People would come in on Tuesday with their spouse and try something new and come back on Friday with their friends to try something wholly different. Um, cool. We were given complete and total license to do whatever we wanted. Uh, because we were also doing things simply. You know, it, it, we weren't doing things that you couldn't understand. It was a great piece of fish, mm -hmm. smartly, you know, with smart components to amplify it. That's it. You, know? as as you have some seasoning and some acidity and some fat. You know, to accompany it all, as long as you bring in the, the basics into it, if it needs some umami, you can always pull in a clam, always does the job. And you, you're, you're a genius. Shh. I just disclosed all my, my secrets. I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. Well, I, I'm I got one more, one, <laughs> one more to add to that, which is smoke. You know, we, oh, yeah, uh, for sure. Every, every restaurant I've ever opened and owned, I uh, put a wood grill in. Uh, mm -hmm. And I use smoke as a foundational flavor the way French use stock cream and butter. Like smoke is my baseline. And, um, I'm anyway, I mean, we, we had, we had a lot of fun. Um, you know, and my servers, this is 2006. My servers, uh, were making about 24% tips on average. Wow. Um, this is at a time when 18 was pushing, you know, the top percentage. It had just gone up from 15 to 18%. Right. My servers are making 24. That's... Why? Because they were engaged because they were, guiding people on an experience that they were like, this is cool. Hey, thank you. Were you tasting your staff? Were you making the dish, bringing it to them oh, and telling yeah. the story of it? I did the oh, same yeah. thing at Oceana. They thought I was crazy in the beginning. I was getting yeah. so passionate and animated about that product. Now here I am trying to serve. I put a uh, totog, you know, black, blackfish on my menu in, mm -hmm. in, in a, in a high-end restaurant in the middle of New York city, 54th and Madison. 
I mean, I had people going, well, that's a junk fish. It's a trash fish. You throw that away. It's bycatch. They don't even know the word bycatch. You know, it had a bulletproof skin. You had to really, and I would, I would scale it and get it crispy, but twice cooking it on the skin. Anyway, just introducing something that was out of the realm. You did it as a, as a, as a basis for your, your concept. I did it as a way of trying to get people to, to reel them in. You know, I went to Spain mm -hmm. as well. And I was introduced to Bocorones, you know, mm -hmm. where you go to the markets and there's little children with the little fingers filleting the anchovies and breaking them off. So now it's attached by the head with the two little guys hanging off and they're laying them out perfectly. You know, it was a glorious epiphany to see that. So I brought it back to Oceana and sure I'm walking through and I'm seeing David Samuels over there and all these guys. And there's a box of the most beautiful shining soil, you know, uh, anchovies. I, I, not wasn't a common thing in Fulton Market at the time. I bought the whole box and I had my staff with me figuring this stuff <laughs> out. And then I had to sell it to my customers. And my staff wasn't going to embrace anchovies. They were like, yeah, 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 sure. You know, no, you know, no, no, no. you know, they were so acidic because they were they were, you know, slightly assaulted, marinated lightly in some white vinegar, taken out within a short period of time, and then preserved in olive oil. And so that's just before you saw the commercial availability of these these things. And I couldn't sell one. So I, but because I had regulars at Oceana, I would, I would just walk them out myself and give them to customers. Yeah. I know they come in two, three times a week. And suddenly they're like looking at the waiter going, why didn't you tell me about this? It's just amazing, you know, because it was, and, uh, and that's how I had to do it. I had to force feed it through storytelling. And then when I gained the confidence of my front of the house staff, then I, uh, then, then we, we, we made some, a mark on the industry, you know, which I yeah, really well, you certainly, you certainly did. So when did Tackle Box happen? When's the, when's the your room? Um... So Tackle Box was uh, That's like my restaurant of yours. Yeah, sorry. New, New England seafood concept, and you know, I was doing high end at Hook, you know, twenty four dollar entrees, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to do quick serve, and we just right next door opened up this concept, and it was we had a wood grill and a fryer, and on the chalkboard menu we had nine different kinds of fish, and you know. Choose your, it was called the main meal. And for $13, you got a piece of fish, five ounces, um, you know, or scallops or whatever it was. You chose your fish, you chose two sides, always change, uh, and one sauce. We had like spicy marinara, roasted lemon, aioli, basil walnut pesto, uh, you know, things like that. Good and yeah. you're like, 13 bucks was this incredible, incredible thing, you know, incredible deal. And it was just fun because it was, it was, you know, convivial. And, uh, um, this is the most fun I ever had in a restaurant was doing that one. I loved that one. Yeah. But, um, you know, to, to, to back to your point though, just like introducing things you have to realize that your listeners like balsamic vinegar was like an ex like nobody had ever heard of it. No. Like, whoa balsamic you know <laughs> olive oil was newly in vogue yeah uh, you know caprese salad was like the you know oh, the was, ingenuity like, sure sure you know so yeah the idea of like bearded brotula or bocarones you know you didn't have these cultures that were you know food cuisines and cultures in the internet driving that sense of like willful and excited experimentation um so were you out yeah, were, were, were those restaurants in, that. were those restaurants in adams morgan no State? those were over in georgetown georgetown oh, and, georgetown uh, nice college see now you've got open minds you've got a, an ethnicity that is concentrated around that part of washington dc especially i would say and so you're introducing new things what a perfect place for you to live out your desires, your dreams, your, your creative uh, energies, you know, just to be in a, a playground like that. That's fantastic. But I, we, we're, we're, used, we're, we're, time is moving fast here. So I want to, I want to accelerate you into where you are today. Cause that was a wonderful story. I've learned so much about you that I didn't know about before. Um, so you decided to take your apron off, throw the hook on a, on a nail on the wall and to educate us all including myself. I mean, you say you stand on my shoulders, but I look up to you and I, I listen to you because you're a, a, a deep thinker. You're ADD like me. You're crazed. I love watching that, that insanity, you know, and, um, you know, and I just want to hear a little bit more about um, 
uh, what you're up to right now. And I want to talk about seaweed. I want to talk about aquaculture. Why don't we start with aquaculture, then we'll see how that works out. All right. You know, this is uh, sponsored by Forever Oceans. They are coming out with a new product called Kahala uh, later this year, you know, and it's absolutely stupendous. We're going to send you a couple of samples as well for cool. uh, taking the time to do this. We'd like to give you a couple of uh, fish in the round and uh, get your reactions from it. Maybe, you know, if you click on a video, we won't mind too much or a recipe. So you can be part of the group that's... Uh, promoting uh, sustainable seafood and from, and then, you know, my perspective is, you know, deep, you know, I've had a single subject focus mm. on aquaculture and sustainability as well as you have for our career and um, most of it anyway. And uh, they're doing it, you know, they're, they're refill, uh, recirculating, um, you know, hatcheries, deep water um, pods that are uh, robotically um, fed so that there really is very little uh, of the uh, uneaten food falling to the bottom and becoming, mm -hmm. you know, a, a a potential risk to the environment and uh, amongst other things. But the most important thing I find about the Kahala is that the texture, the flavor, the nutritional value, and uh, the overall experience of eating it is really from raw to grilled to everything else is amazing. So that being said, and I know you have also uh, seen like I have the evolution of uh, aquaculture. And, and I, I like to focus mostly on the fin fish. A category because mm -hmm. I think it's the fastest growing area of aquaculture. I don't think we've tapped out on, on crustaceans and oysters and clams and everything else that's been formed rates forever. Shrimp obviously outpaces everything because everybody likes the cockroaches of the ocean. But the uh, fin fish category, <laughs> waiting for a reaction from the <laughs> it's Muna, did you just say that? Yes, I did. And and you know the the, the legalities and I don't you know I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into it, see what is what is that this 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 stupid thing out right now on uh, on uh, Netflix. conspiracy that's yeah, it. Yeah, and yeah, that yeah. is just so much sensationalism. I mean, it might raise a few eyebrows to say maybe I should pay attention to this, but it's telling, you're telling, they're telling people not to eat fish, so let's not let's not go down that road. Aquaculture, Orton Seaver, how do you feel about aquaculture? Oh man, I, I was I was I was wickedly against it. Um, you know, it That's was bizarre. farmed and farmed and dangerous. Uh, Alexander was, Morton, you know, was was my you know talking point. You know, you and I, one of the first times we ever met, actually, we you and I were testifying in front of the National Organic Standards Boards down in D.C. Um, you know, basically just saying like, "How dare you even think about fish? Because farm fish is just evil." Um, and then I had an epiphany moment. Uh, with a company called Blue Ridge Aquaculture and they were farming Arctic char up in West Virginia. And, you know, I, I approached it with, with all the typical metrics like ah, feed conversion ratio. You're feeding them, you know, eight pounds of anchovies to get one pound of char out of it and you're killing the waterways and blah, blah, blah. And, and I went there, you know, and it was like, well, okay, yeah, but they're, you know, their their metrics are really pretty good. They were like 1.4 pounds of fish in to fish out and and they research systems or raceway systems and they had mitigated a lot of the just sort of surface metrics that were used to attack aquaculture and i looked around and i was like this is a damn county in west virginia with a 30 percent poverty level and they've created 65 jobs yes you know yeah. huh if there's, you look a, cobia, around, you know, there's listen, a cobia farm out there too i remember visiting yeah, you know and, and, you, you know you listen to like the the biblical tales of like loaves and fishes yeah. Uh, you know, the miracle of that was not like that Jesus just kept producing fish. It was actually that uh, everybody there took only what they needed and then shared the rest. And what we had was actually enough. Okay. Um, and so here I am thinking like, okay, so 1.4 pounds of fish in 65 jobs out. That's a damn good ratio. Yeah. Huh. Talk about feed conversion ratio. How many families did you just feed a lot? Yes, sir. That's when my focus shifted. When I said maybe there's something more to measure here, um, and there's a lot of, of sins. There's a lot of errors still being made. Mm -hmm. but there's also an incredible trajectory. You know, aquaculture as a as an industry globally is 50 years old. Oh yeah. I, I mean, you know, this thing. Didn't exist 50 years ago. A computer the size of the Pentagon. Put it down. Put it down. Couldn't couldn't do what I do, you know, with this phone. You know, cars were unsafe at any speed. Thank you, Ralph Nader. You know, industries evolve, 
And aquaculture right. was was never given the leeway or the license to say, okay, yeah, I mean, you're making mistakes, but we're interested in your trajectory. Um, and, you know, a lot of those early errors, the things we held against aquaculture and still do in a legacy bias way, they've solved. Why? Because it's more efficient and they make more money when they're operating sustainably, meaning not throwing away food or killing fish or it's, you know, it's like, um, so now I, I'm to the point where, like a lot of other people, I look at aquaculture and I don't regret the passions that drove my positions early on, uh, but I regret that I lacked the full context. And now I see aquaculture really as, you know, I guess I started off thinking that it was human. It was my responsibility to go fix seafood. That's what sustainable <laughs> seafood was about. But then I realized really that with aquaculture advances in management, et cetera, that actually it's our opportunity to use seafood to fix people. That's right. Yeah. And that's, that's where I'm at now. This deeply humanitarian sort of vantage point of like, no man, aquaculture. Yeah. You can call it farming a fish or you could call it job creation and women's empowerment and, you know, empowering people to stay in place and climate, you know, preventing climate refugeeism and nutrition and health and food security and justice. And like, those are fun conversations to be having, especially when dinner is delicious. So how important do you think it is for aquaculture companies to have a transparency and a real story? It's a setup. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's essential because the bottom line is that we, we as a society don't understand the industry at large. You know, I mean, if you just told Rand, I mean, Joe Plummer for, you know, there, there's our avatar of the average American, Joe yeah, Plummer. I see a thanks, crack thanks. somewhere in this. <laughs> yeah. Thank, you know, well, you know, from the Trump campaign, Joe, Joe Plummer, <laughs> um, you know, say, Oh, Hey, I, you know, you know, th it's a factory town. Oh, okay. I don't even know what the factory makes, but I get it. Like mm -hmm. I understand blue color America. I associate all these values with it. Great. Middle class, upward mobility. Great. You know, it's like, you don't even know what the factory makes and you've applied all of this social license to it. Mm -hmm. But you say like, Oh, you know, it's an aquaculture community. Like mm -hmm. what's that? You know, uh, not for there's ignorance. a lot more questions, isn't it? <laughs> not, not for, you know, a lack of, of intelligence, but just, lack of exposure. We, we don't know it. And this is what we see happening. This is why films like Seaspiracy are so effective, uh, I think, in a terrible way. Uh, it's because we just don't understand. We don't understand the value. And so it's easy to attack the entire industry. I mean, when we see salmonella outbreaks from cantaloupe or from spinach, as we've seen in, in years past, sure. do we convict agriculture as sinful as no. terrible as something no. that shouldn't exist like no no yeah. like, but yeah. but we convict seafood as guilty in these broad strokes and we so yes more, to your more, point story we need more education though i mean i remember as a child put on the tv there wasn't a lot on but i mean i'm, I'm, I'm up real early it's like 5 30 in the morning six couldn't couldn't sleep whatever reason i'm watching television extremely early in the morning and the only thing that was on were these uh, shows about agriculture. And they showed you the, the amber wage of grain, the American way, all the wonderful things, the farmers, everybody's smiling and everything's fantastic. And we accept that hands down as American in the way of life mm -hmm. because of that, or I did, you know? And then when it came to aquaculture in the ocean, just, it was, just there was no connectivity to it all because there was no shows on early in the morning showing you about fish, being bred and, and, and transported, you know, uh, to the oceans, you know, from this freshwater start and what a pelagic is, a migrating species, you know, and all of these different things. We don't, we don't know. You and I, it, we, we go along and we, we do we do our, uh, our talks. And oftentimes, you know, we make assumptions that they understand what we're talking about. And, and I, don't, I know that we're, we're in a much better place today than we were in the past, mm -hmm. but um, today, what, do you, what is your feeling about, I, know, I understand because I, I parallel your uh, uh, disdain towards uh, the aquaculture at one point. I'm like, this is terrible. And then now I, I, I realize that if we're going to feed the planet, you know, 
We need to have uh, a, some real steady supply of good quality proteins and over 50%. I don't know if it's as high as 60. Someone was mentioning that. I don't know why I was talking to someone. They said as high as 60% of the uh, seafood that we consume in the United States or globally actually comes from aquaculture sources. That's, that's what blows my mind. So if we're going to feed the world, we have to do better aquaculture and better aquaculture is being done. But what's your, what's your, what's your, uh, what's your feed on that? Well, uh, a couple of points in, in reacting to, to what you're saying, but also just, I mean, aquaculture is not just this thing that we can begrudgingly do because, oh, well, we have to feed the world and I guess aquaculture can help. Like, no, no, no. Like, it's this incredible catalyst mm -hmm. for achieving all of these other social goals, uh, you know, economic development, women's empowerment, uh, uh I think it's like 70% of all people employed by aquaculture globally uh, are women. Wow. And did not know that. So did not. It, it's like, so if, if you want to invest in women, you know, obviously there, there's a lot of nuance to this, but like, huh, like, wait, these are actual direct pathways in these new economies that aren't uh, beholden to these sort of patriarchal, you know, foundations and, just there's a lot of cool stuff. And I mean, that, that's a whole college course to dive yeah. into. And like, I mean, I taught one, I know this, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, you know, my classes at Harvard, I would get like two hours to teach the ocean. They're like, you can, you can do that, right? Two hours, everything. And you're like, ah! But it, it goes to show you that like, it's just not part of the toolkit that we think of when we think of human and the human reality we don't see ourselves on, on the water. And that speaks to your point about like the amber waves of grain. I mean, this is, that's the very thread by which the fabric of America was woven. That's right. Um, you know, it, we literally sing and genuflect to it, the amber waves of grain, the fruited plain, it's in our damn songs. Yes, it is. You know? But before we moved into oceans that rippled with amber waves of grain, we, you know, founded this country on the tempestuous waves of the North Atlantic and the cod and the men and women that fished it. That's right. Um, well, and that, that idea that, you know, what's the future of aquaculture, the future of food is that, you know, we think land beautiful for our presence there. Mm -hmm. You know, the gently undulating hills patterned with perfect rows of corn as it leads the eye into autumn splendor setting sun, the red barn paint, you know, fading, the white barn, you know, the white house paint chipping the picket fence, like, hot damn, you know, this is us. <laughs> yeah. Watch out, Robert Frost, you Barton Seaver's here. You know, I mean, we have Chevy ads like a rock, you know, it's like, I mean, we, th th that is us, right? We think land beautiful for our presence, but right. You know, if you ask somebody what a farm is, what a what an aquaculture is, or what what a fishery is, they might, you know, in their mind stand on a dock and gaze wistfully out at the wine dark sea, thinking that a fishery happens somewhere else, yeah, employed by someone other, uh, wow. beyond the horizon of our attentions. Um, but you know, to understand what a fishery is or a water farm is, you stand on that dock, yeah, but you turn around and you look at the houses and the quality of education and the opportunities for a daughter to follow in generations of bootsteps to live life on the water. And when we see a fishery or a farm as such, we see ourselves reflected in it. Yeah. We see yeah. our values. And then we begin to do, to effectualize what really needs to happen, which is the cultural revolution of seeing water beautiful, not for our absence, but for our presence there. Mm -hmm. Um, what, um, and that, that's I, the subject of a lot of my work. I'm going to ask you a deep question because you and I battle this messaging, this connectivity. We're trying to reach a tipping point of people going, aha, I get it. It's not, you know, and they start to consume more seafood in a more responsible way. What, okay. Ideal. What is your ideal 10 years down the road? We've done our job. What's it look like in the world of aquaculture is, in particular? Uh, humans have evolved gills. Uh, we've got webbing between our uh, retractable webbing uh, between our legs that we can uh, we, oh, we just me... evolved into the water. No, um, let, what, what would you say? Look, we succeeded. We, we uh, even if it's just one box you're ticking off out of a dozen in your life goal. What would be the ideal scenario? What transpired over those ten years that has changed so much that you finally said, <sighs> "I'm 
Good. So uh, Americans are eating two servings of seafood per person per week, uh, which is what our own government recommends as a minimum. Uh, USDA dietary guidelines are, are recommending even an increase uh, in that uh, for specific populations. But bottom line is the American diet is not rational. You know, it's it's red meat based, it's climate impactful, uh, you know, and, and we pay for the American diet several times. You know, once with farm subsidies and our taxes, once, with our once, health. At, the, once at the store, uh, once again at the hospital when it makes you sick, and then again with climate change. <laughs> yeah, the American diet is the most expensive thing in our reality. Uh, rationalizing that diet to be plant forward, mostly vegetables, but uh, a lot greater proportion of seafood, um, that is success. And that added demand is going to real success is going to come from us also rationalizing supply chains and telling the story. I, I am pro seafood import. Hmm. I, I am. What? You know, we import, we import, what? we import 90% of the seafood we eat in this country. Yeah. Uh, that should be rationalized. But bottom line is we should be investing in communities through our purchasing decisions. Mm -hmm. And just because it's an import doesn't mean it's bad. Actually, it could have come from a community that our dollars are radically changing for the better. But we should rationalize to greater proportion of production and consumption coming from our waters, uh, regionalizing consumption. And that means both New England-based food systems, mid-Atlantic, but also then, you know, let's put a damn salmon farm in Flushing. Let's build another one in Milwaukee. You know, let's take all the defunct mall real estate all over this country, put some damn solar panels on top of it, grow some fish in it with all of the workers that are already trained, have a great work ethic and nothing to do, create vital hubs of health, nutrition, job development, all of this everywhere. You think there's going to be That's urban aquaculture? You think there will be urban aquaculture? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. the, the, the money is there. Uh, taking food production systems you know, maximizing the efficiency of them, putting them directly in market. Yeah. Uh, whether or not you want it to happen, the bottom line is the money is there. It's going to happen. People are going to invest in that. And fortunately, I think it is actually, you know, a triple bottom line. It is a win all the way around. Agreed. Barton, we've been, we've been yakking for well over an hour now, and I just, I could talk to you forever. We have to do another podcast and, Talk about seaweed and talk about, you know, the Coastal Culinary Academy and all the, all the wonderful things that you're involved in. You have got so many facets to you. You're so brilliant. And I love uh, spending time with you. And I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and uh, plow forward, my friend. And hopefully in the 10 years time, you and I will be able to sit down and go, ah, look at that. Look at that. You have a great yeah. day. Yeah. And I just hey. thank you for your time and, and all our listeners. Thank you for tuning in to uh, Ocean Raised. Uh, Barton Seaver. Yes. Wait, 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 what are you talking about? Are you kidding me or what? Look at this tome, this beautiful book. Everybody must get this book. I swear to you. This is amazing. American seafood. It's everything you want to know and more told in a very succinct manner. And there's a lot of stories behind it, you know, in the history. It's like, forget reading Old Man in the Sea. Read that book. All right, Barton, you have a great day. Love you, brother. Have a good, take it easy. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Jeff. You inspire me. I do what I do because of you. Thanks. Have a good day. Foreverocean.com.